So it's my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Saxida, recently from Cambridge. You may have heard of it. Uh, arrived now at Weston. Um, in a couple of years, there aren't going to be any cognitive neuroscientists left in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> They're all going to be here. <laughs> Three years, four years. Um, so I won't read out the title, but you can read it yourself. Lisa. Thank you, Tim. You Thank you. Um, yeah, and I have to say the weather is much better here, I can say today, than it is in, in Cambridge. And um, let me just start by saying how excited I am to be at this, this meeting. So what I'm going to do in my talk today is I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to talk about things from a very different perspective. So sort of almost the opposite to what the way Russ um, is approaching the problem. I'm going to be telling you a story about examining in great detail a, a very tiny chunk of the standard cognitive ontology that we use and how we can, can look at that and look at the, ask questions about how we design our tasks, how we think about these concepts, um, how we can make very specific predictions about whether these uh, sort of cognitive concepts are, you know, can be validly mapped onto the brain. And also um, how we can use causal experiments. So rather than imaging, I don't have any imaging data in my talk at all. Um, it's all going to be the sort of old-fashioned lesion approach, where at least um, in, you know, in contrast to imaging, it's sort of complementary because we can look at, at causality. So you know, if, how, if we damage a bit of the brain, how does that um, affect our particular task? And therefore, is that bit of the brain essential for this, this aspect of cognition? So you're going to go quite deeply into one aspect of, of the ontology. And, and the other, the reason, one reason I'm really excited to be um, talking here is because when, when Tim Bussey and I first started this program of research, sort of in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, um, it, was, it was so controversial because it was, it was attacking a very uh, well um, respected aspect of the cognitive ontology that actually um, we had Larry Squire phoning up Journal of Neuroscience saying, look, don't publish this paper because it's not right. It can't be right. It wasn't that the, the methodology was flawed or that the data were bad. It was that, you know, these people can't be right. And it didn't get published there. So, um, so it's, it's very nice now to, to be in a whole room of people who are, are, are open to questioning some of these sacred, sacred cows. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start here. I, I think probably um, most people have, uh, has everybody um, sort of seen these two, two ways of characterizing memory in particular? So if you've taken, if, if you've taken a basic psychology, cognitive psychology course, you will have seen these two models. So, so what I'm showing here is the, the Atkinson and Schifrin modal model of memory where we have three basic types of memory. So we have sensory memory, which is very, very, very short-term memory, um, sort of maintained in its raw perceptual state. We have short-term memory, which is like the um, sort of amount, length of time it takes you to rehearse, to, to remember a phone number, a seven-digit phone number. Um, and then long-term memory, um, which can last indefinitely and, and has, um, uh, and is uh, su subject to interference. So that's the sort of very classic view of memory. And then we can take long-term memory and divide it up into different components. So long-term memory can be divided into explicit or declarative memory, which is essentially memory that's accessible to our conscious awareness, um, versus implicit or non-declarative memory. Um, so. Uh, examples of explicit or, or uh, declarative memory are things like episodic memory, so our sort of personal autobiographical memory, our memory for things that have happened to us in our lives. Um, uh, and uh, the other form of declarative or explicit memory is semantic memory, so facts, knowledge, that sort of thing, things that we can learn from a book. We can divide implicit memory, so this is unconscious memory, into things that are maintained in what Schachter originally referred to as the perceptual representation system, things like priming, um, where you can have a subliminal presentation of a stimulus and that can affect your subsequent performance on a task involving that stimulus, or procedural memory, which again is unconscious memory, it's, it's motor skills, conditioning, things like that, learning how to ride a bike. Okay? Um, and basically, if you open up any cognitive neuroscience textbook, you will see versions of these two diagrams, and this is the way people in the field think about memory. Okay? And that's fine. 
But the natural extension of this um, has been to try to map these particular concepts onto the brain. We all know this, right? So um, the assumption is usually that uh, if we can map these aspects of memory onto different bits of the brain, then those bits of the brain maintain specialized mechanisms for handling these different types of memory. So the convention in, in cognitive neuroscience is to think about um, declarative memory being localized in the medial temporal lobe. This has been referred to as a me the medial temporal lobe um, memory system. And that system includes brain structures. Well, it's sort of the, the, the center of the system is the hippocampus. And, and the cortical regions around the hippocampus, one of which is called perirhinal cortex, are also thought to support this kind of memory. This contrasts with this perceptual representation system, which is basically um, the, the sort of visual regions that were actually defined very nicely um, yesterday in Adina Roski's uh, uh, talk about um, uh, the ventral visual stream and the, the visual representations that build up in complexity as you move down the ventral visual stream. And um, the convention is to think about the medial temporal lobe memory system as being dedicated to declarative memory and declarative memory only. Okay, so um, structures in the medial temporal lobe memory system are involved in this particular type of memory. Um, the perceptual representation system is important for visual perception and visual perception only. Okay, and you can see why that is, um, and, and tasks that sort of tap into that these aspects of visual perception, like categorization um, and visual discrimination. And you can see why this is really compelling, right? So it maps on to our, our sort of folk psychological notions about, how, about the, the sort of differences between a declarative memory uh, process and a, and a visual perception process. And a lot of the work is based on studies with amnesic patients uh, who, when you, when you um, look at an amnesic patient, they show very profound impairments in this form of memory. And they don't show on the surface um, any impairments in visual perception. You give them standard, a, battered, a battery of standard visual perceptual tasks and they're perfectly fine. Okay? Uh, amnesics, the, the type of amnesics that I'm talking about, have damage typically in the hippocampus and maybe the cortical regions around the hippocampus and, this, and not in this perceptual representation system suggesting um, a very clear connection between the structures in the medial temporal lobe and this form of these forms of declarative memory. Um, however, uh, over the past sort of 15 years, um, we and others have been building a program of research that suggests that, that, that things are changing and, and this notion of perception and memory being localized in, in different bits of the brain and not interacting um, it may, may not be quite right. So it's unlikely that the brain operates in this way where we have memory here and perception here, but instead these things are a little bit more um, mixed up. So instead it's much more likely that the cortical circuits are performing um, very similar processing functions, possibly even the same processing functions. But the argument that I'm going to make here and the data that I want to show you suggests that it's the different representations that lead to the emergence of what appear to us to be different cognitive phenomena. Okay? So I'm going to um, give you a little bit of a history of, of our particular take on this issue. I then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the predictions that this way of thinking make that we can then test experimentally. Okay? Um, and, and as I said at the beginning, so I'm focusing here on this, this quite specific issue, this, this distinction between perception and memory in the brain as a, as a kind of uh, an initial proving ground for this idea. The other point that I want to make actually before I get into this is that my approach has been to um, to simplify things as much as possible. So I'm not trying to account for everything in the brain. I'm not trying to account for all aspects of cognition in the brain. But instead, I'm looking at this very particular issue using a very, very simple model that abstracts away um, some of the complexity. OK, but uh, you know, I mean, this stuff is hard to think about. So having this very simple model that I can actually understand um, <laughs> is about the best I can hope for at this point. OK. Right, so 
so as I said, okay, we've got these different, the, the standard in the field at the time that we started doing this research, that we have these different bits of the brain, medial temporal lobe memory system, um, perceptual representation system, and they do different things. Um, around that time, there was some data um, sh um, indicating that actually, if you damaged um, regions of the uh, medial temporal lobe system and uh, memory system, in particular perirhinal cortex, in some cases, you would see um, impairments on tasks that looked like perceptual type tasks. So one possibility, um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really clear what was causing the impairments. Um, and so one possibility we thought was to think about these, instead of these as being two completely um, separate parts of the brain engaged in completely different processing functions, let's think about the representations that are maintained in these different parts of the brain, okay? And so one thing that was very clear and that was discussed yesterday was that um, um, as you move the representations of visual information, as you move down this ventral visual stream, um, become more and more complex. So you get neurons early on in the ventral visual stream that respond to very simple aspects of stimuli, lines and edges. As you move downstream, you get um, neurons that respond to perhaps conjunctions of these, these things. By the time you get to infratemporal cortex, sort of at the end of the ventral visual stream, you've got neurons that are responding to very complex things. You know. Um, complex stimuli. So what we started to think about was, well, maybe this representational hierarchy extends further beyond the ventral visual stream and into the medial temporal lobe, okay? So maybe the, uh, and maybe, and, and so if that is the case, then what kind of, what does this, um, what can this tell us about the tasks that we're using um, and about the functions of structures within the medial temporal lobe. So the time we, that we started this work, um, Bob Desimone was starting to record from neurons in perirhinal cortex, which is part of this medial temporal lobe memory system, and finding that perirhinal cortex neurons actually respond to very complex um, conjunctions of features and stimuli, so things like objects. Okay? And what we, what we started to think about was, um, you know, maybe this representational continuum extends into medial temporal lobe, and it's, it's not the processing that's different, but it's the representations. And maybe it's the case that these, um, that the, the structures within the medial temporal lobe are not important just for declarative memory, but instead are important for any type of cognitive task that requires the representations that are maintained there, these complex stimulus representations. So to address this question, we focused on perirhinal cortex. And in, in particular, we focused on this cortex, this bit of cortex, because it was a canonical part of this medial temporal lobe memory system. So, um, as I said before, the perirhinal cortex is uh, in conjunction with the hippocampus and other bits of the cortex around the hippocampus, sort of the canonical, um, yeah, you know, sort of <coughs> crux of this, this, mem this system thought to be important for memory. But perirhinal cortex also happens to be just at the very tail end of the vent ventral visual stream. Okay, so it's the next station on beyond um, IT or beyond TE in the rhesus macaque brain. So it's really the structure that's, that's situated at the interface between these, these systems that are thought, were thought to be important for perception and these um, in, independently for memory. So it seemed very likely that perirhinal cortex, if it's maintaining these complex object representations and also happens anatomically to be at the end of this ventral visual stream, it's probably important for visual perception as well, not just for um, declarative memory. So um, in order to, to, to try to get at this question, we had to come up with a, a task, a very specific task that did not have a declarative memory component, but that required the use of these complex perirhinal level um, representations, okay? So to do this, we thought about the different levels of visual representation in the ventral visual stream. And, um, you know, this is just sort of a, this isn't very accurate, but this is just sort of a, a schematic of how it, it kind of works. So you can imagine an individual object is represented throughout that ventral visual stream, not just in one part, right? But it's represented in different ways, in different parts of the stream. So if you take this um, soccer ball, you know, it can be represented in terms of its individual features early on. So the, you know, the black curves, for example, in terms of conjunctions of those features as you move um, rostrally down the stream. So, um, you know, the little uh, pentagon there. And then um, in, uh, as an entire object by the time you get 
to perirhinal cortex, okay? Um, now, another point here. I'm only considering the feed-forward connections. That's not to deny that there's all of this feedback and top-down processing that's extremely important. But what I'm trying to do here, what we were trying to do here was create the simplest possible model, um, Occam's razor and all of that, parsimony, to account for the data that we were trying to account for and to try to make clear specific predictions that we could test experimentally. And the idea was we'll, we'll add additional complexity as we need it to explain the data or to make predictions. So we're talking only about feed forward system here at this point. Um, and what we reasoned was that we could force the use of these perirhinal complex object representations if we made the lower level representations that are maintained in earlier regions of the ventral visual stream um, not very useful for solving the task that we were giving. Okay? And the way we were going to do that was by making them ambiguous with respect to reward. Okay? So um, what do I mean by that? Here's an example of one of the first tasks that we used to try to do this. So this is something actually taken from the animal learning literature. That's what my background is. It's, it's called the biconditional discrimination in that literature. And um, what... Oh, I also am using animal models. That's something else that's different about my talk. So, um, so almost all the data I'm going to talk about is in animal models, although there's some human stuff too. Anyway, what the animal has to do is um, imagine you have four different stimuli that the animal's going to see. Two of those stimuli are rewarded, so they're followed by a yummy food pellet or strawberry milkshake. Two of the, um, if the animal chooses them on the screen, two of the stimuli are not rewarded. Okay, um, But the critical thing about these stimuli, they each consist of two features. So in this case, it's shape and fill pattern. Okay, We can represent those features in terms of letters here. And um, so if we imagine A is this shape and B is the polka dot, polka, uh, no, actually, oh yeah, A is the polka dots and B is the, the um, shape, then this, um, this stimulus that consists of features A and B is rewarded. Um, but this stimulus that consists of feature A, the polka dots, but a different um, fill shape is not rewarded. Okay? Um, same for fe features um, C and D. So the point of this task is that each individual feature um, is, is part of an object that's rewarded and also part of an, an object that's not rewarded. So, so the key is that the individual features are ambiguous with respect to reward. So A is sometimes rewarded, A is sometimes not. And what you have to be able to do is represent the conjunction of those features in order to solve the problem. So know that A, when it's presented with B, is going to be rewarded, but when it's presented with D, it's not. Okay? And that's kind of the, the, um, the, the core feature, I think, of all of the tasks that I'm going to be telling you about today. So what we're doing is um, forcing the use of these more complex representations because the simpler level representations are not useful for solving the problem. And this is something that we've referred to as feature ambiguity, okay? Um, which you can modulate um, to various <coughs> extents. So the idea is that the um, relatively complex representations that you get, for example, in perirhinal cortex are going to be able to resolve ambiguity of features at earlier levels in the system. Yeah? Um, and if you damage perirhinal cortex, for example, any type of cognitive task that requires the use of those complex conjunctions of features or gestalt representations um, is another way of referring to them, that are maintained there will be affected. It doesn't matter whether the task is a memory task or a perception task or whatever other um, aspect of cognition. If you need those representations, um, you're going to need your perirhinal cortex. Okay? Um, another thing that's important to say here is it's not that we think that perirhinal cortex is like the feature conjunction bit of the brain. People have put forward theories like that in the past, in particular with respect to hippocampus. But this, this resolution of ambiguity happens throughout the stream, right? So it's a, a sort of progressive thing. So these regions will resolve ambiguity from um, in these regions, and this region will uh, resolve ambiguity from earlier regions, and so on and so forth. So it's a sort of hierarchical thing um, where resolution of ambiguity 
increases. Okay, and then by the time we saw this um, yesterday as well, the Jennifer Aniston cell, this is uh, Rodrigo Kian Quiroga's work. He also happens, he's Argentinian, so Diego Maradona, Diego Maradona is a, another uh, favorite target of his. But by the time you get to hippocampus, the idea is that you've got really complex um, conjunctions of information that can help resolve ambiguity for example, at the object level in perirenal cortex. So in hippocampus, you're starting to get spatial information, contextual information, um, all sorts of stuff feeding in to enhance the um, complexity of the representation. Um, OK, and, and so to make predictions about this particular um, perspective, we built and this is an embarrassingly simple computational model, okay? So this is like your standard feed-forward network with uh, increases in re representational complexity. That's it, okay? Um, uh, and, but the very simple idea was, so, was that we would have these different levels of representational complexity. Um, so sort of feature, we, we actually boiled the ventral visual stream down into one layer. So, um, so we have sort of very... Um, uh, sort of elemental or simple representations on one layer, conjunctive representations on a, on a second layer, and each of these levels of representation can be associated with reward um, or a representation of outcome. And the idea is you can make simulations simply by removing that, the, the more complex representations to see how that affects performance on your particular task. So this kind of model, this sort of hierarchy, nothing new, but what was new here was applying this to a particular question um, to explain behavioral data from a novel set of domains. Okay? So then we did a, a, a load of different experiments looking at this particular question. So. Um, we started with rhesus macaques uh, at NIH when Tim and I were in Betsy Murray's lab. Then we moved into rats and we also looked in humans to test this idea explicitly to see whether we could find um, a role for perirenal cortex in visual discrimination independent of memory. So here is the very first task that we used. You'll see that this maximum, so this is a simple discrimination task, the maximum ambiguity condition is the biconditional discrimination that I just showed you where you have to be able to represent the conjunctions of the shape and the fill pattern to solve the task. Um, we had a version, a, a, a control condition, which was a minimum ambiguity condition where, all, where you can solve the problem on the basis of shape or fill pattern on its own. So you can see there's no ambiguity here. And just for fun, so that we could have a um, line, we had an intermediate condition where half of the, um, the features were ambiguous, of half of them uh, and half of them weren't. So notice, this is a... Um, it's a visual discrimination task. There's no overt declarative memory component here. The animal has to remember the rule, but there, it's not, um, there's not, that wouldn't be defined as typically as declarative memory, um, accessible to conscious awareness. So according to the view at that time, um, we should not have seen any impairment in these animals after damage to perirenal cortex, because that's um, a structure that's involved in memory. These were the data from the model. Now, of course, the model was built to, to, to simulate these data. So it's, it's, and it's, you know, anyone who knows anything about modeling will know this is no great surprise. So, you know, you take out the, the, um, the perirhinal layer and you see a huge impairment. So we're looking at errors to criterion along that axis. Um, and the models obviously couldn't do the maximum ambiguity condition because they didn't have the representations required to, to solve the problem. And in the minimum ambiguity condition, they were perfectly fine. Okay, so that's not at all surprising. But what was interesting was that our data in the monkeys looked exactly like that. Okay, so these are animals with damage in perirenal cortex. You give them a visual discrimination problem where you... Um, have this highly ambiguous condition. These are the control monkeys. We're looking at numbers of errors till they got to a particular level of performance. And the, and the, the monkeys with damage were highly, highly impaired in the maximum ambiguity condition. In the minimum ambiguity condition, they were perfectly fine. So this is the experiment that took us three years to get published and that Larry Squire got on the phone about. Um, because, uh, because it's not a test of declarative memory. Memory is controlled across all three 
conditions here. The only thing that differs is the degree of feature ambiguity. Right? So this is an example of where you know, really um, thinking about your task and, and focusing on the details of the task is extremely important. Because if we had just said, oh, this is, you know, um, this is a visual discrimination task, it wouldn't really have told us specifically what perirhinal cortex was doing here. Um, oh, yeah. And then we, we did a lot of, so we, so that's just one example to give you a sort of a flavor of the kind of experiments that we did. We manipulated feature ambiguity in many different ways. So we morphed stimuli together, um, did all sorts of things. And, and over and over again, we're finding in our animal models um, this connection between uh, or sort of an impairment after perirhinal cortex damage whenever we manipulated feature ambiguity in different ways. Um, of course, these, these animals are models for humans, and so, um, so what we want to do eventually is look at, at performance of humans on these tasks. And so that's what we subsequently did um, with Kim Graham and, and Morgan Behrens in Cambridge. We tested patients on exactly the same task that we tested in the monkeys. Now, we had two groups of patients here. So it's very rare, in fact, almost impossible to find patients with damage restricted to perirhinal cortex which is one reason why we want to do the animal studies, because we have more control over, over the damage. So, so what we used here were um, patients with hippocampal damage. So you do fi pa find patients with damage in the hippocampus specifically, um, more commonly. So we had patients with damage in the hippocampus. We had patients with uh, damage generally in the medial temporal lobe. So these patients all had damage in perirhinal cortex plus hippocampus. So the idea is we, sub, you know, we compare performance of these two groups of patients, and we can assume that any differences um, are due to the, the damage to the perirhinal cortex in the medial temporal lobe group. And then we had age-matched controls. Um, on the same task, looking at errors to criterion, what you can see is the same pattern of performance. Okay, so these are black are the controls, white are the patients with damage restricted to hippocampus, and these are the patients with damage in perirhinal cortex, hugely impaired in the maximum ambiguity condition. These are amnesic patients, okay, these are patients with severe memory deficits who on the surface don't show any visual perceptual impairments if you give them standard tests, but if you tweak those visual perceptual tasks in a very specific way, then you see this massive impairment come out, even with no memory component. The other interesting thing about these data, um, nobody liked these data either, because the hippocampal patients are perfectly fine on this task. So another kind of um, component of that medial temporal lobe declarative memory system view is that all of these structures within the medial temporal lobe memory system are for declarative memory sort of in the same way. So getting dissociations between two structures within this medial temporal lobe memory system, at least at this time, sort of 10 years ago, was also um, controversial. And we used a bunch of different types of stimuli and replicated the effect um, over and over again. Okay? Now, one of the criticisms, of course, of this, um, this task was that there is this learning component. So the participants have to learn the task over trials. And maybe, I mean, I didn't really buy this argument because they had to, you know, these three, they have to learn it in all three of these cases, and they're only impaired on this one, right? But the argument from the, the declarative memory camp was, well, there is this learning component, so, you know, maybe that's why these patients are impaired and why these monkeys are impaired, because of this learning component. So it's not perception. It's learning, which is more like memory, right? So, so it's okay. We can keep our ontology. So what happens when you remove that learning component? So here's an example. This again was um, done by Morgan Behrens of a, an odd oddity task. Okay, so same type of idea. We're manipulating feature ambiguity here, but this time there's no learning involved really at all. You have to remember the rule, like what to do. But what, what the participant does is they get a screen, they get um, seven different objects, and they have to choose the odd one out. Okay, and that's it. So they get different stimuli on each trial. They have to choose the odd one out. We can uh, construct these stimuli in this kind of artificial way to create, to again, vary the degree of feature ambiguity. So the ones on the top that look sort of like mutant turkeys, um, you know, have very clear individual features. So there's no ambiguity um, in, that, in that condition. And there's maximum ambiguity where you have to pull together different components to solve the problem in that uh, D condition there. 
Here, with no learning component, we found the same pattern of effect. So these are the same patients that I told you about earlier. Um, and in this condition, maximum ambiguity condition, again, our patients with perirenal cortex damage are highly impaired. Okay, hippocampal patients are fine. Um, minimum ambiguity condition, everybody's fine. Uh, Mark Buckley um, did similar experiments in rhesus macaques with perirenal uh, damage and found similar pattern of effects. Okay? So, um, yeah, so, th so this is just, um, just to say that, um, that a load of people have now replicated this, and, and I think it's interesting, actually, because I've seen this whole, so like I was saying, when we first tried to publish these data, nobody wanted to hear about it. Now, and then we went through this phase, so a few years later, so people, it started to get published, and then people started to say, oh, yeah, but that's obvious. You know, we knew that all along. There's nothing new here. So sometimes we'd, we'd be in this curious position where we'd, we'd um, submit a paper, and one review would say, um, oh, this is, this is crap because, you know, it can't be true. And then the other reviewer would say, oh, this is crap because we've known this all along. So... Um, so, so it was frustrating for a while, but now you go to the Memory Disorders Research Conference and most people there um, sort of are very open to this point of view. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so I think now at this point in psychology, there are still a few people, Larry Square still doesn't like us very much, but um, most people agree that structures within this medial temporal lobe memory system are important for uh, cognitive functions outside of declarative memory, okay? Including um, visual discrimination. So now I just want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the, uh, you know, predictions that this particular um, framework has made. So it's interesting, you know, it was interesting to try to knock down the standard way of thinking about declarative memory, but I think what's more interesting is, is some of the counterintuitive predictions that came out of this, this um, sort of modeling effort and, and some of the experiments that made us think um, a little bit differently about how the brain works. Um, and also some sort of implications. So, so I've shown you that structures within this medial temporal lobe memory system are important for visual perception. If that's the case, then a, another prediction of this, this perspective is that structures, we should see the opposite, right? So structures within the ventral visual stream should be important not just for visual perception, but also other types of functions, perhaps even declarative memory functions. As long as we're using the appropriate level or the appropriate type of stimulus information, right? So the, so the prediction is that if we use uh, V1, level stimuli, then we should see impairments in recognition memory after damage to V1, um, even though V1 is a classically visual structure, and assuming that the animals can see um, enough to see the stimuli. And interestingly, um, last year Mark Baer published a paper that showed exactly that. So this, is, this, is, this, quite, this sort of implication is much more difficult to look at um, than the one that we spent most of our time testing, um, because it's, it's difficult to come up with the right stimulus material, it's difficult to figure out how to damn it, you know, how to maybe affect plasticity in V1 so that you don't knock out vision completely and then can't test your animals at all. So, um, but Mark Baer did this last year, and I'm not going to go into, into much detail about it, but what I am going to show you is, um, uh, just to, to give you the basics, so, so the way that we look at recognition memory in animals, which is thought to be a, 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 another way that we look at recognition memory, which is thought to be um, a, a type of declarative memory, is using this task here called spontaneous object recognition. Okay? So the idea is that what you do is you get your rat or your mouse to um, spend a few minutes exploring an object. We use two objects for technical reasons. Um, Rats and mice are really tuned into novelty, so they like exploring novel objects. They'll go, they'll sniff them, um, generally explore them. Then what we do is impose a delay, and then we have a test phase where we give the animal a new object and a copy of the old object, and a normal rat or mouse will spend most of his time exploring the new, obje new object. Okay? And so what we can, we can vary this delay, and this gives us an index, you know, if we give them a really long delay, and they spend equal time exploring the objects, we know they don't remember the old object. Um, if they spend more time exploring the new object, we know that they're, um, you know, that, that's an index of their memory for that object. 
And rats do this completely spontaneously, so you don't need to reward them. There's no learning involved. And the, the really very well established clear effect in the literature on this is that if you damage perirenal cortex, my favorite structure, an animal will do well on a task like this at very short delays on the order of a few seconds. But if you increase the delay, then an animal with damage in perirenal cortex will start to, to really bottom out. Okay? So, in fact, interestingly, in the animal literature, there's this kind of um, perspective that perirhinal cortex actually operates almost as a module for object recognition, okay, for recognition memory, because this effect has been shown so many times and it's so clear cut. You always see this, okay? Um, it's, it's true that perirhinal cortex is critical for recognition memory in this case, um, but, but the, the way of thinking really is that, that perirhinal cortex can be thought of as a recognition memory center. Again, sort of the, the opposite of this, or sort of the partner to this um, uh, medial temporal lobe declarative memory thing. So what um, Mark Baer did is he, he, had, he had a very long, complicated experiment that did all sorts of interesting things. But the thing that I was interested in was he had a version of this recognition memory task that I've just shown you, except it used gratings, so the types of stimuli that neurons in V1 are really interested in. I'm not going to go into any detail about the experiment except to say the animal spent a few days habituating to a grating going in one direction and then they were given a novel grating and um, they showed that same recognition, uh, spontaneous recognition memory effect where they would spend more time exploring the novel stimulus after habi being habituated to the familiar one. Okay, so here we're looking at uh, preference for the novel stimuli, so there's a uh, novel stimulus, so they're spending more time exploring the novel stimulus, standard recognition memory. The interesting thing is if you give them AP5, which, is, um, which affects NMDA receptors, so you put this in their perirhinal cortex, what it, what it does is it, it doesn't shut down, uh, did I say perirhinal? I meant V1. You put it in V1, it doesn't shut down the structure completely, it just inhibits plasticity in that structure, so there's no sort of um, learning or uh, perception. Um, perceptual learning, any sort of learning going on, but what's happening, uh, but you're still, uh, the, the, the region is still able to process information, so the animals can still see, and what you can see is that uh, if you do that, the um, animals lose their, so here this is vehicle, this is saline, the animals are showing novelty preference, you uh, cut out plasticity in V1, and they lose that novelty preference, okay? So this is just an example of a spontaneous object recognition task, but it's a sp spontaneous grating V1 stimulus recognition task. You damage a visual perceptual region, it's still processing information, and you see the specific memory effect, okay? So this is the partner of what I showed you before. Um, so memory structures are important for visual perception tasks. Visual perception structures are important for memory tasks as long as you use the right stimulus information. Okay? Um, now, this is taking me longer than I expected. I'm going to show you a couple of more. Um, actually, hmm. What should I do? Okay, I want to get to, I want to tell you about the uh, uh, one final thing, which is a very counterintuitive prediction that this particular theory made. So I'm actually going to skip this um, this bit, which is basically I'll, I'll just summarize it in one minute, which is um, you know this notion of double dissociation, which is uh, is the again the sort of gold standard for mapping brain function onto parts of the brain. You damage one bit of the brain, you get an impairment in task A. You damage another bit of the brain, you get an impairment in task B, but not task A. These two structures are important for these different, and these tasks are mapped onto psychological functions. It tells you that region A is important for function A and region B for function B, etc. You can model, um, and that's something that's been used a lot uh, to, to um, uh, differentiate between these memory and perception bits of the brain, and I, I just wanted to show you that using our model, we can um, actually model these double dissociations in the absence of any modularity, but I'm not going to tell you anything about that. That's a sort of standard thing in the connectionist model 
world. Okay? But what I do want to tell you about, is, and this is my final experiment that I'm going to tell you about, is another kind of implication of this point of view is that if, if we've got memory perception, memory areas doing perception and perceptual areas doing memory, these two things should kind of interact with each other and these perceptual factors should influence memory. They're not completely independent and we should see functional blurring of these two uh, processes. So you've seen this already. I'm going to show you some experiments that use this particular method of measuring recognition memory to get at this question. Now remember I've shown you that the classic very well established um, uh, result that we see is this, this um, impairment in performance after damage to peri perirenal cortex at long delays on a uh, spontaneous recognition memory task. And what I want to look at is um, the intuitive explanation that everyone um, sort of assumes for this particular effect. And I want to show you that that explanation may not actually be correct. Okay? So the intuitive explanation here is that the reason that um, the animal is impaired is because damage to the structure is causing problems with a long-term memory process. Okay, that's the assumption everybody makes. So at very short delays, things like short-term memory or working memory are still intact. So the animal is perfectly fine on this task. But as you increase the delay, now you're getting into the, into the territory of long-term memory. And so because perirenal cortex is important for this long-term memory, then you start to see an impairment. Okay? And this is taken to be canonical evidence for perirenal cortex being involved in long-term memory. But what happens if you decrease the memory load to zero in this particular task? So what if we get rid of the, the memory component completely and just um, replace that memory demand with a perceptual demand? Okay? So we did that. We uh, decreased the delay to zero between the study and the test objects. Um, Susan Barco did this in our lab in Boyer Winters, who's now at Guelph. Um, by, well, it doesn't matter how we did it. The point is that she devised this very clever way of, of uh, in having zero delay. So he, she, the animal would have an object to study, um, and then Susan would pull this little door out so that the next object behind it was revealed. So there was basically a zero delay between the study and the test objects. Um, and Susan varied the perceptual similarity of the stimuli. So this was a way of increasing feature ambiguity. So this is the only thing that varied across conditions. And what she found was that in this task, again, with no memory load, um, the animals with perirenal damage were highly impaired when the stimuli had high ambiguity, were very similar, not impaired at all um, when the stimuli were very different. So here we're getting what looks exactly like a delay-dependent impairment on this task, but there's no delay and it's only perceptual, perceptual factors that are changing. If you put a stimulus um, interpolate, a, a kind of potentially interfering stimulus into the delay, you get the same kind of effect. So if we muck about with perceptual interference, again, no memory component here, we're just affecting the perceptual information, then we see, again, what looks very much like a delay-dependent effect. So if you put a stimulus in during the delay that looks similar to the uh, discriminanda, you get a, high imp a big impairment in these animals. If you put something that looks very different in as a control, we don't see any impairment. Okay, so there's this role for the notion of interference here as well. So perceptual factors are important. But what are the implications of this? Okay, so if we bear, bear this notion that um, perceptual factors are important in mind, if we go back to that conventional explanation of the delay-dependent deficit in object recognition, um, let's think what the impairment would look like. Okay? So the idea is that um, why do we see impairments in this task? On the standard um, explanation, so the animals have this intact short-term memory system but an impaired long-term memory system, right? So a, a normal animal, what he does, uh, shown here in pink, he explores on that that test phase, he explores the novel object a lot because they're tuned into novelty, they like novelty. He doesn't explore the familiar object very much because he's adapted to it, not interested, right? Animals with damage in perirhinal cortex. So if they have an intact short-term memory system, 
an impaired long-term memory system, what do we expect them to do? On that test phase, they're going to explore the novel object a lot, just like the sham rat, because it's novel, they're tuned into novelty. They're also going to explore the familiar object a lot, because it's fallen out of their short-term memory. We're beyond the point of short-term memory, they've forgotten it, their long-term memory is impaired, so they're going to think that that familiar object is novel. right? So this is the explanation, and that's why we see no difference in explanation, exploration of novel and familiar in the um, perirhinal animals. But I've just shown you that we see a very similar effect when we manipulate perceptual factors, okay? or when we interpolate a similar object into the delay, thereby creating interference. So is there an alternative explanation of this very canonical delay-dependent effect that we see that, that um, we can uh, make in terms of this notion of feature ambiguity. Okay? Now on our theory, the reason on this theory about feature ambiguity and in the model, the mechanism um, for uh, uh, what happens during a delay, the assumption is that during a delay, the animal or person encounters is sitting there in their cage looking around the room in, and um, encountering a number of different objects and stimuli, et cetera, during the delay, right? Um, they're going to get a lot of um, input uh, from features that are very similar to what they might have encountered during the study phase. So, so they saw an object during the study phase, they're going to get, you know, maybe it was a, a black box, they're going to get input now from the black chair, which has, also has black vertical lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, uh, features in the environment that the animal is going to encounter um, that will be similar to what they saw during the study phase, but what the animal's not going to get is the same object that it saw during the study phase. Now, if you normally have a perirhinal cortex that, that can re represent these complex conjunctions of features, that perirhinal cortex is going to be able to tell you that, um, you know, when you, see the, when you see the test objects, it's going to be able to tell you that that specific conjunction of features is not something that you've seen during the delay. It's not something that's familiar. But if you um, don't have a perirhinal cortex, all you're going to be left with are the sort of earlier level representations of individual features, some of which may have overlapped with different things that you saw in your environment during the delay. So if you only have those individual feature representations to work with, and you don't have a perirhinal cortex, because you don't have a perirhinal cortex, then when you get to this test phase of the task, the animal may think um, it's seen all of those features before that comprise this new object. So that object is familiar, okay? The longer the delay, the more interference you get. Um, this is a simulation from our model using this mechanism showing that you get the classical de delay-dependent uh, deficit when you make that assumption. And the interesting thing is that this theory makes a very, it makes the opposite prediction to the standard, um, standard one about why animals are impaired on this recognition memory task. Okay, so according to our view, a sham animal during that test phase, we'll study the novel object lots and the familiar object a little bit. The animal with no perirhinal cortex, well, all of the features look familiar. It's experienced all of this interference. So as a result, the, the familiar object, of course, looks familiar because it's seen all of these features. And that's familiar. But the novel object also looks familiar because although the animal hasn't seen that particular object before, it's seen all of the features of that object before. All of the features look familiar. So without that conjunctive representation, he thinks that novel object is familiar. Okay? So this is the nice thing when you can make a counterintuitive prediction. Actually, the model made this prediction. We were, we were building the model to explain uh, data in the literature. It made this prediction, and we were like, oh, this can't be right. You know, because we were completely, you know, this was our assumption as well, basically, right? And, and we thought, well, we've got to test it. We didn't really want to test it. We thought it would probably disprove our model, actually. Um, this notion that it's not that the, the familiar object looks novel, but the novel object looks familiar. We tested it, and amazingly, we found out that our prediction um, was supported by the data. Okay? So the reason, so we had to devise a slightly different version of the task to be able to look at this compared to the way people normally do. I won't tell you um, the details, but the, the bottom line is that animals with perirhinal cortex damage are impaired on this task, not because the um, familiar object looks novel, 
but because the novel object looks familiar. Okay, so this was great. We thought this was great. Science liked it because it was so, um, and it was just a, a poxy old lesion study. The interesting thing to test that, and I'm almost done, um, to test, to, to sort of see whether this interference could be the underlying mechanism, the way we decided to test that, the, the rationale was that if, um, if it's all of this interfering information that's coming in over the delay, what happens if we block that interfering information, right? So the idea is if you block that interference during the delay, then we should be able to rescue these animals. So we developed this very sophisticated um, experimental apparatus where we um, put the animals in a bin <laughs> during the delay. Um, and so normally animals would spend that hour-long delay in a, in a cage with lots of stimulation. Um, in this condition, we put them in just a, a very dark chamber. Um, and this is what happened. So these are our uh, animals with perirunal cortex damage. Suddenly, they look exactly like normal animals. Now, this was really wild because these animals are always wiped out completely on this task, right? They have no perirunal cortex. They can't do the task at all here. Um, they're completely at chance. You put them in a dark bin during the delay, this very, very simple in intervention, and their performance looks completely normal. So, yeah, we never expected it to be, um, to be like that, that clear. You put, them, put the same animals in the normal condition afterwards, and they're impaired again. So it's not that their perirenal cortex grew back or anything. Okay? Um, so again, this was very uh, interesting and controversial at the time because you know, uh, this perirenal cortex, a structure that anyone in the world would tell you um, is critical for object memory, is even a module for object recognition memory. You put, um, you put animals with damage in this module in a bin during the delay, and there's no impairment in object recognition memory. Okay, so clearly that structure cannot be a module for object recognition memory. But other bits of the brain are contributing to the task. So I'm just gonna finish up by showing you that we replicated this. This is a model, a genetic model of Alzheimer's disease, shows the same thing. And the final point is that our collaborator Morgan Brenz um, has also now tested this in humans using, uh, I won't go through the test because I'm out of time, but it's exactly, it's an analog, it's exactly the same as the spontaneous object recognition task, except it uses eye tracking. So the participants are looking at these stimuli, they look more at novel stimuli, less at familiar stimuli. Um, same sort of manipulation of similarity. Um, she, she had um, healthy elderly participants um, and participants that were at risk for mild cognitive impairment, according to the MOCA test that somebody was talking about yesterday. Um, if we look at our controls, uh, what we see, so again, we have a, the, the repeated condition, so we expect them to look at those less because they're familiar. We have two um, interference conditions, a high and a low interference condition, so the difference here compared to the mouse and rat studies is we manipulated interference directly. Um, and what you can see as expected is that the, um, so we're looking here, this is, uh, you know, equi equivalent to the recognition uh, measure that we looked at at the animals, and um, in the uh, low interference condition, they spend most time looking at the objects, which is what we would expect um, in the controls. And if we just look at our, our, our participants that are at risk for MCI here, they show normal performance on the repeated or familiar objects, um, actually normal performance in the low interference condition, okay? But when we look at the high interference condition, we see exactly what we saw in the rat and mouse models, okay? So these, these people who are only at risk for mild cognitive impairment, so this is really early on. They may have come into the clinic with, you know, because they're forgetting their keys more often than usual, um, and that's it. And they're showing the same sort of recognition memory impairment. So they're impaired not because the familiar object looks novel, but because the novel items look familiar, okay? Um, and those are the data from the mice and the rats, just to show. So anyway, I'm going to finish off there, and I, I hope this was just an interesting um, perspective on how, if we look very closely at our 
tasks. We, we question our assumptions about how um, these sort of the cognitive ontology maps onto these tasks and maps onto the brain, um, how we can actually maybe start thinking about reconfiguring this stuff. And my argument, the strong argument from this perspective would be that we should really be paying much more attention to the representations that are maintained in these brain regions um, instead of assuming that these different processing functions are going on in each of them. Thank you. And I didn't talk about that at all, but there's a whole other arm of this research that looks specifically at hippocampus and um, in, in, in patients with hippocampal damage. So, um, so Kim Graham has done a lot of this work, some of this originally in collaboration with us. If you damage um, hippocampus, you see impairments on sort of analogous tasks to this. So, so we've done a whole series of experiments manipulating ambiguity, sort of spatial ambiguity, where you, where you blur images together and, um, and you get specific impairments in hippocampal patients on these spatial tasks which Larry Squire didn't like either. Um, <laughs> and Eleanor McGuire has recently started doing um, quite a bit of work in that, in that area as well, again, showing that if you manipulate spatial information, you can bring out impairments in these in patients in, um, in, um, in, in, with specific hippocampal damage. And we've also done, um, so we've done other experiments with, um, in mouse models looking specifically at the dentate gyrus in, of the hippocampus where you, which is one of the regions in the brain where you get neurogenesis, so growth of new neurons, and we find in those models that actually a separation of spatial information is, um, is, is uh, so it seems like the new neurons in the hippocampus are critical for the separation of spatial information and visual discrimination tasks. So if you take a mouse model and, um, and, and ablate the neurogenesis, so they're not growing any new neurons in the dentate gyrus, then they cannot make these very fine-grained visual discrimination, spatial visual discriminations, but animals with intact neurogenesis can. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was just curious, so there's a, there's a long literature in sort of the memory domain uh, looking at sort of, you know, in healthy young adults, the impact of things like retroactive interference, and you, you sort of um, so, you know, presentation of similar information subsequent to what you're trying to remember. Mm -hmm. And so you talk a lot about sort of the deficits that you see in, these, in, in rats and in humans with peridrinal or parahippocampal damage. But you can make a healthy young adult presumably behave pretty poorly under conditions of high interference. Mm. So I'm wondering whether you think the, the difference in some level is just a quantitative one in the sense of how impaired these patients are? Mm. Or is there, you know, I mean, what, what a lot, why is it that, you know, in a person with an intact parietal cortex, they presumably can still sort of exhibit these patterns of sort of retroactive interference? Mm. Um, is, is it the question of stimulus content? Is it because, you know, you're looking specifically sort of at high ambiguity sort of perceptual features that you're seeing this deficit? Or if you move to more abstract concepts, do you see sort of uh, less, less of sort of a, an influence of, of, of ambiguity? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's I think that's really interesting. I do think it is, um, you know, as I was sort of arguing, it's it's all um, at every stage in the ventral visual stream and into the medial temporal lobe, you're increasing the level of representational complexity. So it really is just a, 
you, you know, you could imagine shifting the, um, and, and because you're missing those, because patients are missing those perilinal representations, they're impaired on this very specific aspect of the discrimination. But yeah, I mean, you could push normal um, participants to have similar types of impairments, I'm sure, if you increase the ambiguity to an extent that, um, you know, it was, it was even more difficult to, to tell them apart. So I think that would be, it would be really interesting actually to look more at the normal limits of the system. Um, you know? I'm just wondering to what extent, yeah, like, like it, it could be the case that with an impact by a rhinal cortex, if you're normal, you don't have problems doing this sort of basic sort of visual discrimination when there's a lot of feature ambiguity. Yeah. But, you know, in other situations, with other stimulus class, yeah. ambiguity is perhaps defined on some different dimension. Yeah. You can yeah. really sort of make them perform pretty poorly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it is interesting when you look, I mean, the, the thing that springs to mind um, in the animal literature, if we can't go up, you know, to semantics, but if you, um, if you increase uh, an, a, an object recognition task, the, the ambiguity there to the extent that you can't solve the problem on the basis of objects alone. So if you have repeated items, not matching to sample tasks, for example, animals um, with hippocampal damage can't solve that task. Animals with hippocampal damage can solve a normal spontaneous recognition task, but not if you keep repeating the, the objects. And, and so what we would argue is that that's because in that version of the task, you actually need the contextual information or spatial information in order to solve the problem. So here, hippocampal damage is affecting the same type of task um, just because the stimulus information required to solve the task is slightly different. You know, so you can imagine pushing that up to the sort of semantic level or, um, and I know Lolly Tyler in Cambridge is doing a lot of work in that, in that area. Your question super quick. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, you didn't mention it, but in your original graphs with the data, uh, sorry, the errors uh, with uh, uh, the lesions, there was. It seemed in every one there was a significant uh, effect, but a smaller effect size for the intermediate stimuli. Yeah. As well as. Um, so what's up with that? <laughs> well, I actually really like that because, it, again, I'm not arguing that perirhinal cortex is like the structure for, um, you know, all ambiguity. But it's it, so in the middle. There's the, in that middle condition. There's some. There's an increase in ambiguity. It's just not at maximum. So we would still expect to see impairments after perirhinal cortex damage because you still have an increase in the ambiguity at the object level. It's just a 50% increase in ambiguity. And just, yeah. sorry, just it doesn't seem as though there's a level of complexity at which the the MTL is involved, right? So I mean, it's it doesn't seem like like there's pure addition hierarchy. No. Now, no. Right? no. And in a way, that helps, right? Because it kind of pushes the whole thing further down. Uh, in, in terms of representational space where now this is contributing to you know, even earlier stuff than you would have thought, right? Well, I mean, I, I think that's a really good point. So, so it's a biological system. It's messy. It's not that we have these different levels of representation in their need. And we don't even know what is represented, really. I mean, there was some discussion of this yesterday. We, we record from these neurons. They seem to respond to certain things in the world, and, but we're using a limited subset of stimuli, and we don't really know exactly what it is. It's called. We know, but we do know that these representations in perirhinal seem to be tuned into objects mostly, and they're useful for sol solving object-based tasks. So it's kind of a nice rule of thumb. But there are plenty of neurons in the perirhinal cortex that, that respond to different types of stimuli. You know, it's all mushed up. So, so, so there are more neurons in the perirhinal cortex that respond to complex object representations than in TE, for example. But there's still you know, plenty of overlap. So it's never going to be clear cut. Um, I'm only talking about this fee forward system. Um, you know, there may be other sort of uh, other effects. So it's, it's, not, it's never going to be clear cut. But the thing that I like about the fact that, um, that we still see that. Uh, so in those er early monkey data, um, the control performance in the intermediate condition and in the difficult condition is, is pretty similar, actually. Um, and that tells me that it, this, the, the difficulty is not, or the, the problem isn't just difficulty, right? So in lesion studies, one of the arguments often is, is oh, well, the maximum ambiguity task is just harder than the intermediate one. So that's why they're impaired for some other un unspecified reason. But we know that those conditions are controlled for in terms of difficulty, um, which, which I like. So, Please join me in thanking Lisa for a great